The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Jay Ferris with Nebraska Farm Bureau, and I'd like to welcome everyone on our webinar this morning on the SBCC rule and, uh, and uh, compliance with that regulation from EPA. We are um, just a quick um, housekeeping thing. Um, if anybody does have a question throughout the presentation, we do have Mark Aaron on the line with EPA. Um, there is a way you can ask your questions. There is a question box that you can uh, type in your question. You can also raise your hand. There's a little button that uh, you can click on and I will see that there's a hand raised. And if you have a microphone on your computer or if you have chosen to call in uh, with your telephone, um, we'll be able to unmute your mic and you'll be able to ask the question directly uh, to Mark. Um, with that, uh, Steve, I'm going to let you give a welcome. Well, thank you, Jay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, certainly very glad to have you all join us this morning and, and to learn more about this, in very, this very important topic. I think it will affect almost everyone in farming and ranching in one way or the other. And so, again, a very, very important topic and looking forward to learn all that we can learn. Uh, first of all, too, I would like to thank our sponsors, uh, along with the Nebraska Farm Bureau Federation, uh, the Nebraska Cattlemen, the Nebraska Corn Growers, and the Nebraska Soybean Association. So again, thank you for joining us this morning and look forward to a very informational time here. And I will turn it back to Jay. Okay, thank you, Steve. Um, and this time I would like to welcome Mark Aaron uh, to our presentation and to our webinar. Mark is an environmental scientist with uh, the Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, region 7 in Kansas City. So Mark, we're going to let you take over and again if anybody has any questions please feel free to ask and we will interrupt Mark as we need to. Thank you Jay, thank you Steve, and thank you everyone for your participation today. I want to let everyone know I've got at the end of the slideshow there's some additional resources specifically for the agricultural community uh, that you can please refer to. I know this is being recorded also, I have my contact information up here as well. If anyone has questions, I'm here to answer them, as well as provide you any of the resources that you need. Um, this presentation is not just germane to farms. It's a general 101 presentation. Um, but we'll just go through it and develop an understanding together. got uh, four general topics to talk about today, the applicability and the basics of it. The recent rule amendments include everything up to the final rule in 2002, which has led us to the compliance date extension of May 10th, 2013, and you'll find those resources at the end of the presentation. This is simply a summary and it doesn't include every provision. You can find the complete rule as well as our official agency guidance at epa.gov slash oil spill. The rule is part of the oil pollution prevention regulation, which includes requirements for facility response plans, and those are facilities that pose a greater threat to the environment. We're here to learn how to develop plans that are designed to prevent oil discharges from reaching navigable waters of the U.S. and joining shorelines. It's important to emphasize that an SPCC plan must be written and implemented, that whatever's done in the field must be mirrored and described in the plan, and vice versa. I'd like to emphasize containment and procedures to prevent oil discharges from entering surface waters. And facilities are required to develop and implement a site-specific plan to address containment, control, and countermeasures. This rule's been in existence since January of 1974, and it's applied to bulk storage facilities, including farms, whenever facilities meet the three threshold criteria. The inspections, policy development, and enforcement cannot be delegated to any other agency, including federal agencies, states, or tribes. And the Oil Pollution Act of 1990 was largely 
a response to the public concern following the Exxon Valdez incident. The regulations apply to owners and operators of facilities, bulk storage tanks, and appurtenances that are involved in any of the following non-transportation related activities. Here are some examples of non-transportation related facilities. Top left is an oil production site in Wyoming. To the right is a refinery in Beaumont, Texas. Bottom left is an electrical power generation facility in Dallas with the large backup fuel tanks. And the bottom right is a bulk petroleum distributor. Also it shows a photo of the loading rack. Top right is a photo of a typical farm. And to the right are transformers at an electrical substation. Below that is a warehouse with drums and totes of petroleum. And to the left is a large fuels marketing terminal in the downtown Fort Worth area. The criteria for being subject to the SPCC rule, there's three threshold criteria. You need to store greater than 1,320 gallons of oil in above ground storage containers, containers and have a reasonable expectation of a discharge to a waterway or an adjoining shoreline. Owners and operators make this initial decision on the applicability of the regulations to a specific facility. There's no requirement to submit your plan to EPA for approval. We do not formally approve or disapprove of plans, but a plan is required upon inspection during the regular workday. Also, the EPA may challenge the initial decision on SPCC applicability made by the owner or operator. Which containers are subject? All containers that are greater than 55 gallons are subject to the rule. So we have a photo of some totes and 55 gallon drums stored inside a warehouse, as well as some saddle tanks that are stored outside that are elevated. Containers that are not counted are those that are under 55 gallons, as well as permanently closed containers do not be, need to be included in your plan. Permanently closed is a definition of all the contents are evacuated, piping is disconnected, as well as a conspicuous sign posted on the tank stating that it's permanently closed as well as the date of closure. The EPA doesn't have a specific definition of oil, however we often look to the U.S. Coast Guard list of petroleum and non-petroleum oils. I've got some of these listed here that can be crude, refined oil products, animal fats and vegetable oils, as well as a typical list of oils we might find on a farm. At the bottom I've got an asterisk next to milk. Milk is still subject to the Clean Water Act, however, it's not an oil. Although the definition of navigable waterway has been changing, essentially these waters are surface waterways and not groundwater. However, groundwater connected to surface waters and a navigable waterway I wonder if we're having some technical difficulties with Mark's microphone. I said Mark is offline, so he must have lost his internet connection. So we do apologize for um, for the technical difficulties. Just hold tight with us till we can get Mark back online.
Hey, Mark, are you back with us? I'm back. Okay. Not sure where I lost everyone, so I just want to go over the uh, some information about navigable waterways. It continues. The definition continues to change. And essentially, these waters are surface waterways, not groundwater. However, groundwater connected to a surface water and a navigable water may have some applicable jurisdiction. Navigable waters of the U.S. What are they? Streams, creeks, rivers, lakes, wetlands adjacent to a navigable waterway where we can determine a nexus. Um, also consider intermittent streams. A good determination of that is something that flows three months or more and depends on several factors. You can refer to the Rapanos guidance from 2008. And it's the defined flow pathway to truly navigable waters of the U.S. That's a good start to the determination. Just don't ever assume that you're not subject or that a waterway or a nexus would not be a U.S. navigable waterway. These photos are simply to stir discussion. The upper left-hand photo is the Vertigus River with an active oil spill in it in Oklahoma. It's a large waterway that connects with the Arkansas River, and it's considered an navigable waterway. The upper right-hand photo shows the steam electric generating facility from a previous slide with a large recreational lake in Texas. It also is a navigable waterway. It's also located directly on a river system, the Trinity River, but doesn't necessarily have to be a navigable waterway. The lower left photo is a flowing creek west of Tulsa, Oklahoma, showing a boom and a back truck working an active oil spill. Since the creek is flowing, has water in it for three months or more, it's considered a navigable waterway. Finally, the lower right-hand photo is a road ditch in a rural area of Arkansas. A road ditch by itself may not be a navigable waterway, but if it connects to one, and it's a pathway to one, the SPCC jurisdiction may apply. You can't make a determination that there's no reasonable expectation of discharge based on the presence of man-made structures such as containment, response capability, and elevated roadways. Therefore, when you make a determination, you can't consider any man-made structures and only the geographic locational aspects of the farm unit or the facility. This initial determination is made by the owner operator. You may also consider your proximity to water, the land contour, and drainage. When there's a heavy rain event, where does the water go? If the facility makes the determination that they're not subject, we say it's a good idea to document that determination where you conclude you're not subject to the rule. This is not a rule requirement. It's just a good idea to have this documented for yourself. Here's some more photos we can discuss in the upper left. There's a petroleum distributor up the street from the storm drain on the corner, which is downgrade from the facility. Items such as offsite drainage flow from the facility are important to examine as well as where the storm drain flows. In this case, the configuration represents a clear case of reasonable expectation of discharge to waterways of the United States. Similarly, a spill from the facility in the upper right photo would flow to a local storm ditch, which may flow to a real waterway, such as the one in the lower right-hand photo. Here, a spill of hydraulic oil or red dye diesels flowed through a ditch to a small lake, which is a navigable waterway. The oil production facility in the lower left-hand photo, however, which is in an arid flat area south of Midland, Texas, may not have to have an SBCC plan because there are no road ditches. They just end or they don't lead to a navigable waterway. In this case, the operator did his homework and looked at the site-specific topography and the potential flow pathways and determined that there's not a reasonable expectation of the spill of getting to a navigable waterway. While not a rule requirement, you should document your basis and your determination that your farm is not subject to the SBCC rule. And section 112.2 is where the definitions are found. I'd like to emphasize three words in the following definition of a facility, which is property, parcel, and lease. And also, 
this statement, the boundaries of a facility depend on sites, several site-specific factors, including but not limited to the ownership or operation of buildings, structures, and equipment on the same site, and the types of activity at the site. Contiguous or non-contiguous buildings, properties, parcels, leases, structures, installations, pipes or pipelines under the ownership or operation of the same person may be considered separate facilities. The definition of facility is not intended to allow tanks side by side to be considered separate facilities. However, according to the guidance, the extent of the facility determines on the site-specific circumstances, and that's determined by the owner-operator. The ownership and management of those buildings, similar functions and activities occurring at the same site, adjacent sections, parcels, leases, properties, shared drainage pathways, The word farm and the definition for it was included in the preamble language. And the definition of a farm was provided when EPA modified the rule compliance dates. The definition of a farm has no rule in the applicability. SPCC rule exempts any oil storage container that is permanently closed where the liquid and sludge has been removed from the container and the connecting line. Those connecting lines and piping have been disconnected from the container and blanked off. All the valves have been closed and locked. And a conspicuous sign has been posted on each container stating that it's permanently closed and the date of closure is noted. These permanently closed containers do not need to be removed from the facility and they may be brought back into and used as needed for various variations in production and economic conditions. The permanent closure requirements under the rule are separate and distinct from closure requirements of other regulations. All SPCC regulated facilities must comply with Section 112.7, the general secondary containment requirements except that oil production facilities are exempt from these security requirements. When we talk about key requirements, we're referring to BMPs, operating procedures, essentially putting them down in writing in the form of an SPCC plan. And remember, there's a template available if a facility has less than 10,000 gallons. This template allows you to fill in the blanks to provide answers to these key requirements. For farms over 10,000 gallons of oil plans are required to be certified by a professional engineer. For those facilities between 1320 and up to 10,000 gallons, you have the option to self-certify your plan. And I'll provide some more details that follow. This is an optional alternative, alternative to having a PE certify your plan where the owner-operator can self-certify. Facilities that have greater than 10,000 gallons. Your plan needs to be certified by an engineer. And the certifying or licensed professional engineer will attest to these six points. That the plan is adequate for the facility. The PE is familiar with the requirements. He's visited your facility. The plan is prepared in accordance with good engineering practices. And there's an establishment of inspection and testing procedures. A facility is still responsible for predicting failure analysis, regardless if there's been a previous equipment failure or discharge. So for every piece of equipment and every tank, we're looking at the loading and unloading equipment, um, where overflows and ruptures and leakages could occur, any other equipment that could be known to be a source of a discharge, and we make three predictions for each type of equipment, the direction, where would it go, how fast, and the total quantity of oil that could be discharged at that point. Technical amendments to your plan. 
must be listed on a separate page or in a separate paragraph. If your facility is greater than 10,000 gallons, those technical changes need to be certified by a PE. What we mean by technical changes are putting tanks in and out of service, replacing or moving containers, installing new pipe, altering your secondary containment, or a revision of operating and maintenance procedures. There's a requirement to amend your plan within six months of a change. If the change is listed in the plan, that needs to be implemented as soon as possible, but no later than six months after the amendment to the plan. Documentation and completion of the review and evaluation must be completed once every five years, either at the end of the plan in a log or in an appendix. A PE must certify only those technical amendments. Um, certification is not required for non-technical amendments like changes to phone numbers or names, who your response contractor would be. PE certification of technical amendments is not required for self-certified plans of qualified facilities, which are those facilities less than 10,000 gallons, unless a PE had certified a portion of your plan and now it's been changed. plan must be maintained at the facility if it's manned more than four hours a day or at the nearest field office if less than four hours a day. Records of inspections and tests kept under usual and customary business practices suffice for purposes of the requirement to keep records. I'll have more information on testing later in the presentation. Deviations from the technical requirements. Uh, there's relief there for environmental equivalence. Those areas of the plan need to be certified by a professional engineer. Training doesn't have to be a complex classroom type of event. It can occur on the back of a pickup truck, but it needs to occur once a year. It needs to cover the necessary items. It could be documented. There's always a designated person who's accountable for discharge prevention who reports to the facility manager. There's two types of uh, secondary containment in the rules, general secondary containment, as well as specific containment for bulk storage containers. The key word here is appropriate. Um, is it appropriate to have secondary, or is it, I'm sorry, is it appropriate to have a containment firm made up of crushed oyster shells to provide secondary containment for a large tank of gasoline? Or is it appropriate to have a containment firm made up of pea gravel, and which is the answer is likely not. Similarly, um, you can use bags of kitty litter for secondary containment to kill, clean up oil spills, but likely not to use bags of kitty litter to build a secondary containment wall. What we're getting at here is the entire system must be capable of containing oil so the discharge from the containment will not occur until that discharge is discovered and cleaned up. The owner or operator of a facility has the flexibility to determine the appropriate type of containment. Section 112.7 offers nine types of general secondary containment. Things to consider would be the site-specific condition, size of the container, type of the oil being contained, the most likely discharge scenario, the amount of expected oil that could be spilled, the distance and gradient to a waterway. It doesn't have to be complex, it just needs to be appropriate for the situation. The upper left is an oil production facility with a containment berm made of soil, which is topped with gravel to prevent erosion. It's perfectly acceptable to have containment like this as long as the berm is impermeable and held in place. Having clay content in the soil is helpful in this regard. The upper right photo is another oil storage facility where there's oil that's been discharged in containment. 
it'll no longer hold another leak from another container. And there's also going to be an issue with a large rainfall event, which would allow oil to be discharged from that containment berm. Bottom left is a typical concrete dike that we see in the field. To the right is another example of that, where in this situation, the secondary containment is likely not sufficient. It's not impervious as that pipe has been, there's been a hole that's drilled through the wall to insert that pipe, and now we've got a void. So when we talk about these, this general secondary containment requirement, we're talking about the most likely oil discharge from any specific part of the facility. Containment can be active and passive, can use spill kits or a dike. And 112.7c lists those nine ways to accomplish general secondary containment. Active measures are those that require deployment or specific action by an operator. They need to be implemented in time to prevent the oil spill from reaching surface waters. Here are some examples where a spill kit's used in the event of a discharge. Another example of an active measure could be placing a storm drain cover over a drain prior to transferring oil to or from a container. These general containment requirements apply to mobile and portable tanks, which include nurse tanks, the auxiliary tank on the back of a pickup truck, transfer areas where you would fill that nurse tank or unload that nurse tank to a piece of equipment in the field or from an auxiliary tank as well. There's no size requirement for it. It just needs to be based on the typical spill size and not the size of the container that you're hauling around. Secondary containment requirements are also part of stormwater pollution prevention rules as well as fire protection rules. It's a specific size for the bulk storage containers held inside of it and must be sized appropriately for the single largest oil compartment or container plus sufficient freeboard to contain precipitation. We don't prescribe how large that calculated secondary containment barrier needs to be. It's a determination made for each specific facility by the owner operator based on rainfall events in your area. Rainfall in eastern Iowa or on a Pacific island is much different than a rainfall event in the desert of Arizona. Bulk storage secondary containment needs to be sized. It can be an earthen berm, remote impoundment, concrete dike. There's an SPCC guidance document available on our website that's also part of the inspector guidance, as well as sample calculation worksheets are also available on our SPCC for agriculture link. Here's some photos of secondary containment at typical agriculture facilities. The upper left photo shows three tanks with no secondary containment. The upper right shows secondary containment full of rainwater diminishing the required secondary containment volume such that any spill from the tank would cause spilled oil to overflow containment. The lower left shows no secondary containment around these bulk storage tanks, although it appears at one time there may have been a containment berm that's eroded to the point where it no longer provides adequate secondary containment. For small bulk storage areas such as these three photos, installation of a berm is not difficult or costly, but a relatively simple prevention measure that could save owner and operator significant costs of cleanup should it still occur. No container should be used for the storage of oil unless it's construction is compatible with the oil stored and under conditions of storage such as pressure and temperature. 
for bulk storage tank installations, secondary containment for the capacity of the single largest container with sufficient freeboard or precipitation is what we're looking for. Dikes or containment curbs and pits are commonly employed for secondary containment, but they may not always be appropriate. An alternative system could consist of a complete drainage tension, or I'm sorry, could consist of a complete drainage trench enclosure that's arranged so a spill can be terminated and safely confined to a catchment basin or a holding pond. This is a photo of a bulk storage tank with severe corrosion, and although simple surface rust may not pose an immediate problem for compliance with the rule, severe corrosion such as large-scale pitting or delamination of the tank would show that the tank's not compatible anymore with the conditions of storage. In this case, a couple of those vertical tanks were USTs that are underground storage tanks that are now being used in an above-ground configuration. Also to note would be the questionable housekeeping that's occurring. Although the rule doesn't address this, it's a BMP that should be employed here to keep the area clean. So that if you discover a discharge, you can adequately clean it up inside. There's a requirement for overfill production on all bulk storage containers. There's a number of ways to accomplish that. These liquid level sensing devices also need to be regularly tested. One way to do that is to follow a manufacturer's recommendation or specification to do that. Here's a photo of a concrete block containment wall. Please note that both the overfill of the tank and leakage of oil through the wall. Here's a common problem with concrete block containment walls where the grout erodes or cracks and flakes out and the secondary containment is no longer impervious to prevent a discharge. Drainage from decked areas should be restrained to prevent spill into a drainage system unless the system's in well, it should just be restrained like with a valve or a weir box. Facilities can also drain a diked area using a pump, but the pump must be manually activated and the drainage material must be inspected before it's discharged. Flapper valves should not be used to drain from a diked area. Also, if drainage flows directly to a water course, then the drainage must comply with the applicable water quality standards. Once the dike's been drained, the valve must be resealed and record must be kept of such an event where drainage is from the dike area to a water course. And what I'm saying is, if you discharge water to the ground before you open the valve, you need to make sure that there's no oil present inside. If you're draining that water to a water course, before you open the valve, you need to inspect it and make sure there's no sheen present then you could open the valve and you also need to keep a record of the date and the approximate quantity of water that was discharged and that record needs to be signed. Undiked areas can be considered under the provision of the rule, especially where there's a potential for oil to be spilled. Ponds and lagoons are not required to be sufficiently impervious under the regulation. However, drainage to an undiked area such as this you need to inspect the drainage for no presence of oil before flowing to a pond or a lagoon or a catchment basin. In the top left, note the ball valve that's in a closed position. And in the lower left, there's, those tanks are on raised gravel beds that keep rainwater from collecting at their base, which is also a good BMP. The photos on the right show an oil production facilities which purposefully pumps or drains water out of secondary containment without inspecting for the presence of oil on the water, which is a violation of the rule and now presents, presents a threat of oil getting into a waterway should there be rain. This is evident um, not only in stressed vegetation, but also the the black or brown spots in the vegetation likely caused by an oil discharge. 
And although mostly water, the, this water had oil on its surface, so what we're saying is before you drain water from containment, the owner operator must inspect the rainwater and remove any oil or sheen before the discharge. Also, a record must be maintained of these events. Loading and unloading areas are not loading racks. And in cases like this, a transport truck simply uses a single hose to pump or load out oil to or from tanks. The only secondary containment requirement that exists for loading and unloading areas is under 112.7c. Those are those nine general secondary containment need to determine the most likely spill event and provide size secondary containment for that volume. You need to conduct regular inspections of all your valves, piping, appurtenances, dispensers, assess the general conditions such as the flange joints, valve glands and bodies, catch pans, locking of valves, metal surfaces, also conduct integrity testing and leak testing at the time of any repairs or replacements to piping and tanks. Have some photos illustrating transfer areas, piping and equipment. The upper left and lower left show leaks of oil from pumps and valves where visible discharges from the bulk containers must be promptly corrected, as well as accumulations of oil and decked areas should be promptly removed. In the lower left, the piping is only supported by concrete blocks, which appear to be sinking into the soft soil. Piping supports must be properly designed to minimize abrasion and corrosion, as well as allow for expansion and contraction. Here's the extended compliance date for farms as May 10, 2013 to prepare and implement an SPCC plan before you begin operations. The SPCC rules exempted pesticide application equipment, boom sprayers, aerial sprayers, your mixed containers, heating oil containers, motive power, and We've also clarified that nurse tanks are mobile or portable tanks. We've changed the definition of facility to include property, parcel, and lease. Simplified the security requirements so you just need to have some adequate lighting to see a discharge of oil at night. And amended the integrity testing requirements to allow greater flexibility. Clarified the definition of permanently closed. Those tanks can be put in or out of service at will. You just need to modify or amend your, technically amend your SBCC plan. Here's an exemption and some photos of pesticide application equipment that's no longer subject to the rule. Heating oil containers above ground or below ground located at a farm or a single family residence that she's solely to store heating oil or use to heat the residence is no longer subject to the rule. Load of power, these pieces of equipment are not subject to the rule. Nurse tanks are excluded from the size secondary containment requirements but must meet the general secondary containment requirements where secondary containment is designed for the most likely spill and needs to be sized appropriately. When filling in the portions of the template that address security requirements, you need to describe how you're going to secure and control access to the oil handling process and storage areas, how you're going to secure the drain valves, prevent unauthorized access to the pumps, secure the out-of-service tanks and pipe connections, and how you address the appropriate security lighting to prevent an act of vandalism, as well as assist in the discovery of an oil discharge. In 2008, the rule was changed to require routine inspections as well as tank integrity testing whenever there's not only a repair 
but uh, just on some kind of schedule, each tank needs to be addressed. Um, there's two requirements, one for periodic visual inspections. Those are generally monthly and annually. There's a checklist available on our website that comes from the Steel Tank Institute SP001 standard. The 2008 amendment and flexibility now requires the owner operator to consult that standard and determine if it's appropriate for use on integrity testing for that specific tank. So one would address the qualifications of who's doing the inspection, how often one is doing it, as well as the container size and how it's configured. Is it horizontal or vertical? Is it in contact with the ground? Is it a double wall tank? Is there any overfill prevention? available on that tank. These inspection requirements need to be accomplished for drums and totes where periodic visual inspection would suffice. Inspections of the tanks are generally based on the standard and those visual inspections are typically performed monthly. We also need to inspect the pipe as well as the fuel transfer areas. The person who prepares and implements the plan can also consider walls and drainage systems to serve as secondary containment. A building can serve as secondary containment. Here's a discussion on qualified facilities, those are that are less than 10,000 gallons in aggregate above ground storage capacity, where you don't need an or a professional engineer to certify your plan if you can self-certify by the owner operator. If the facility increases the capacity over 10,000 gallons, then a PE must certify the plan within six months of that change. Reportable discharge history, We're talking about a discharge of oil to water, and in this case it would be 1,000 gallons of oil or fuel getting into water, or two discharges of a barrel or more in a 12-month period. Discharges from natural disasters, war, and terrorism do not count towards a reportable discharge. A discharge as a result of vandalism is included in that history. If you have a spill, you need to call the National Response Center. That number should be listed inside the plan or inside the template. Spills to water don't necessarily, you don't lose your eligibility. The regional administrator just has the authority to re either require the PE certify the plan or to require the owner operator to make some amendments to that plan. Self-certified plans must follow the rule requirements. What we say is you can't deviate from the rule and you need to follow the sequence of the rule when you prepare a plan if you're a Tier 2 facility. Tier 2 facilities are less than 10,000 gallons but have one tank that's 5,000 gallons or greater. The owner operator makes the same attestation as a professional engineer would. To be eligible to use the template, the facility needs to have less than 10,000 gallons of storage, no spills in navigable waters in the three years prior to certification, and no tanks or containers greater than 5,000 U.S. gallons. You can either write a full FPCC plan and self-certify, or you can fill in our template that's available online. We've also got an example template there that one could edit and simply type over the answers that are in there. If you choose to use the template, you, um, you need to follow all the requirements that are in the template. You can't make any changes to it. Here's a web address where to find it. If anyone needs some help getting back there, I can point you to it.
Here's a summary on qualified facilities, those that are less than 10,000 gallons. No spills in three years prior to your certification date. If you have no tank greater than 5,000 gallons, you're a Tier 1 facility, you're eligible to self-certify and complete the template. If you have a tank that's greater than 5,000 gallons, your facility is still less than 10,000 gallons, you can prepare and self-certify a plan in accordance with all the applicable requirements. For those farms with greater than 10,000 gallons, you need to hire a professional engineer to certify your plan. Plan must include the attestation by the professional engineer, and the PE cannot use the template to complete the plan. It needs to follow all the rule requirements for general and specific secondary containment. The compliance date has been extended to May 10, 2013. All non-farm facilities are now required to be in compliance with the SBCC rule amendments. Again, here's the compliance date for farms. Um, if you've been in operation since or after August 16, 2002, you have until May 10, 2013 to prepare an implement plan. Have farm fact sheets and blank tier one template available on our website. I have a photo coming up here that will show you what the blue book looks like. We have example templates for those farms as well as an example tier two plan that's been written for a farm scenario. And we've got telephone numbers for information. Here's a photo of our blue book that's available on our website. It's just the general requirements for the rule. All oil discharges to navigable waters of the U.S. and adjoining shorelines need to be reported to the National Response Center. So our centralized reporting center that makes the call on whether to inform EPA and or Coast Guard depending on the location of the incident. When there's large discharges of a thousand gallons or more or more than two barrels in a 12-month period, there's a requirement to report to the RA within 60 days. Alan Hancock's number is still listed as a contact here. I can provide my phone number. This sheet just hasn't been updated yet in my slide presentation. But anywhere you look for SBCC information online, you'll now see my name and phone number as well as my email address. Contact information for some other regions and offices. I can take questions from the field. Yeah, um, we do have a couple of questions. Mark, uh, the first one, and also I just want to point out, I did have one question, um, if we could send out uh, the web address for the templates and also uh, those contact informations, I think that would be okay. Everybody on, on the call or on the webinar this morning, we will send an email with all of that information out to everyone, if that's okay with you, Mark. So, um, the first question we have this morning is, would liquid fertilizer count as a product that uh, would fit into SBCC compliance? Fertilizers do not, are not subject to the SBCC rule. The only liquids that are are those that contain oil. Okay. Um, then the next question we have here um, is waste oil heater is a waste oil heater tank in a shop exempted? That's not residential heating oil. No. It, has to, it has to be single residential. Or part of that. Yeah. Yeah, a waste oil heater would be exempt. It is exempt, as, okay. As a, as a residential heating oil container, and there's been that exemption that's made for those heaters in use at farms. Okay. okay. Now let me go. Um, I have a couple of them related to fines. Uh, one is what is the penalty if if uh, this is not done by 
May 10th, 2013, and, and the other one relates to fines, too. What are the fines, and will EPA inspect um, my farm? I can address those as, with two different answers. Um, generally, our process for inspections at all facilities is to go out and collect information, come back and complete a report. That report's returned to the owner-operator of the facility, as well as forwarded to our compliance group here in the office. And there's a number of mechanisms for compliance that could be a no further action letter, a letter of warning. There's expedited um, enforcement measures for fines anywhere from $400 to $5,000, and there's those can even be elevated to a traditionally administrative litigated case or referral to the Department of Justice. Those are our general mechanisms. I can go as far as to say this, and I'll go out on a limb. In the four state region, Iowa, Nebraska, Kansas, and Missouri, there's more than 50,000 facilities that store oil in quantities greater than 1,320 gallons. And that number, 50,000 or greater, doesn't include farms. My branch goes out and inspects about 100 facilities a year, and generally we target those facilities based on their risk to a waterway, their previous discharge history or previous history of noncompliance, whether or not those facilities are located in an area where there's a drinking water intake. And my colleague who's soon retiring in about 100 days, Alan Hancock, been conducting inspections for more than 12 years. He's never visited a farm. In the next 100 days, I don't think he's expected to visit a farm. I've laid out my targeting strategy and maps for the next several years, and in that targeting strategy, there's no farms on the list. Right. That being said, there's no, there's still a, a duty for facilities to comply with the rule, but EPA is not going out to inspect farms, nor are we doing overflights of facilities with planes to determine their compliance with the SPCC rule, and we're not using drones for the same activities. Okay, that kind of, I guess, gets into that next question, is, um, and that is with the SPCC plan, uh, is that part of the on-farm inspection checklist that would occur uh, on a livestock facility fly following a flyover? No, it's not. It's not. Okay. Um, next question uh, relates to the security lighting. Um, but uh, the question was on a center pivot system where they have uh, diesel tanks, uh, there is not electricity there, and I guess the question is, would a solar-powered light suffice? Currently, they're using uh, the headlights on their pickup to check it after dark. I would say both of those scenarios would be adequate, whether it's headlights or solar-powered. Okay. Um, and to take the – I'd just like to draw – provide some comment too on center pivot systems. Um, often, but not always, those systems are equipped with like a thousand gallon fuel container. I know sometimes they're equipped with one that's larger. Mm -hmm. um, and those units are far enough of a distance apart where an owner operator can make the determination that each of those irrigation units is a separate facility. Okay. That being said, uh, if you count each one of them as a different facility for the purpose of it's less than 1320, and if it's greater than that, then you can still call each one a separate facility, but just have a template available for Based on the property parcel and lease. Based on the property parcel and lease definition. Okay. And contiguous and non-contiguous property. Okay, because in that, we had another question that kind of relates to that, too, and that is, um, 
you know, what is a facility? Is it a quarter section? Is it just the farmstead? Or, but I think you answered that, and correct me if I'm wrong, but that's up to the owner's definition? That is up to the owner's definition, and you can use any of those definitions or attributes to one's advantage like that. You don't have to consider each USDA farm unit as a facility. We allow property parcel and lease, contiguous and non-contiguous pieces of uh, property. Uh, it could be a road that splits two different properties together. And also in that defini de definition of facility, one should consider the types of activities that are happening at the facility quote unquote site. Uh, so that facility could be large or small just based on the types of activities that are occurring there. Okay. Uh, next question we have here. Uh, it says many feedlots are under the Clean Water Act or under the Clean Water Act are required to have in place holding ponds that catch and contain all runoff from their facility um, and includes freeboard. Uh, even though I cannot consider this since it is a man-made object, can this count as my secondary containment? As long as the outfall would not be to surface waters of the United States and could that holding pond take a slug of fuel or oil from the capacity that's there at the farm where there, you know, that's like your most likely discharge. If you've got a 5,000 gallon tank, could that holding pond take a 5,000 gallon slug of fuel to it, still not breach its containment, still have enough capacity there, and also that holding pond doesn't outfall to the surface water of the U.S. Okay. Um, okay, our next question here um, it goes back to the uh, to the irrigation wells. And if I determine that each of my irrigation wells are a separate facility, because each well only has a thousand gallon tank, uh, does that tank still need to have a specific secondary containment? Not to be. Uh it's not subject to the rule. Um, however, it's a good management practice to have some kind of secondary containment or to inspect those tanks on some kind of periodic, regular basis. But those tanks are not subject to the rule. So therefore, that facility is not subject to the rule. OK. Um, another one on the, the pivots. Um, how is it treated um, when? You know, a farmer that rents a pivot system that doesn't own the tank itself, but he owns the fuel in the tank, how is that going to be treated? Both the owner and the operator of the tank are required to be in compliance with the rule. So the owner, if that, if that tank is subject to the rule, both the owner and the operator should have a plan for that facility. Okay. Uh, the next question we have here is, if a Tier 1 area is within an area protected by an EPA-approved livestock waste control facility, what are the containment rules for the fuel area? There's the containment rules for the fuel area. Um, there's two containment rules. One is 112.8, which is secondary containment for bulk storage containers, as well as 112.7C, which is the general secondary containment for loading, unloading, transfer operations of that fuel. Okay. Uh, the next question we have here is, uh, I believe for pesticide permitting purposes, EPA has expanded the definition of waterways to all waters. Uh, will the SPCC rule remain limited to navigable? Um, 
And could you expand on EPA's guidance review of navigable? And could the defi definition of navigable change? The, our definition and our guidance is based on the 2000, I believe it's 2002 Rapanos guidance, which came out of a Supreme Court set of opinions. Navigable waters of the U.S. is described, as I tried to allude to with several slides, just to open up the discussion on that, that um, perhaps even a roadside ditch that has a nexus to an unnamed stream or an unnamed creek that's a tributary to any kind of named creek, named waterway is a tributary to a river. All of those can be navigable waters of the U.S. Okay, uh, next question. Um, uh, did Congress uh, just recently extend the compliance deadline again to September 30th of 2013? I don't have any information on that. I've only got information on the SPCC rule, its applicability, the compliance date is May 10, 2013. Okay. Um, I'm sorry, congressional liaison, not me. Okay. Uh, for compliance to the rule, is there a minimum distance from navigable waters? There's no minimum distance established. It's on the owner operator to make a determination of if the facility is subject to the rule. And one place to start doing that is to see where fuel, or I'm sorry, see where water collects and where it drains to and heavy rain beds. And we're always talking about a worst case discharge. Mm -hmm. Okay, next question we have here is, um, can you discuss in further detail how different farm sites can count as separate sites? Oh, I think we already talked about that. Yeah, how farm sites can um, count as separate sites under the rule. And then also with how that... Can farm sites count as separate sites? I, yeah, I think that's what they're getting at. I think I'd go back to the three words property parcel and lease and the definition of facility. Um, as well as Part of that definition where it could be continuous and non-contiguous and looking at the buildings and the activities that are going on on that site. Okay. Um, also, another question uh, wanting uh, discussion further on the difference between nurse tanks and mobile refuelers and the requirements for them. Those are the general secondary containment requirements under 112.7c, and there's nine opportunities to satisfy that requirement. And one looks at the typical activities that are involved with a nurse tank. A couple of those would be filling the nurse tank as well as driving that tank out to a part of the field to unload that fuel to a piece of equipment and there would need to be some kind of containment that's sized appropriate for the most likely discharge, which would be filling the tank, filling the nurse tank at the yard where the bulk storage tank is located, as well as going out to the field to unload that fuel to a piece of equipment. So you don't need necessarily to travel around with the containment dike. You could satisfy that with drip pans, absorbent materials, shovel in a bucket. Um, okay. Let me see. We have another one here. Um, let me 
Okay. Here's a, okay, the next question that I have. Is it correct that any operation that was in existence prior to 2002 should already have an SPCC plan on hand? If so, the May 10th deadline only refers to new facilities started after 2002. Is that correct? The May 13th deadline, May 10th, 2013, is for facilities that began operations on or after August 16th, 2002. For those facilities that were in operation before August 16th, 2002, they needed to prepare and implement a plan when they began operations. Okay. Okay, here's another question. Uh, please explain loading and unloading areas. And is this separate? Is this a separate structure from the fuel containment? Um, I didn't see any photos of this. What we mean by a loading and unloading area is the area at the facility where that tank truck from the co-op or that bobtail arrives at the facility and unloads fuel from a compartment or the truck to the facility's bulk storage container, that's a loading or a transfer of fuel. Another loading or unloading or transfer of fuel would be filling that nurse tank up or an auxiliary tank or even putting fuel in your own pickup at the bulk storage container. That's a transfer of fuel. You take that auxiliary tank or the nurse tank out to the field to fuel a piece of equipment, that's another type of transfer or another way to think about a transfer. And so size secondary containment is appropriate for any of those scenarios, meaning general secondary containment applicable to 112.7c where you've got nine ways to satisfy that with just some examples could be a drip pan some absorbent materials, kitty litter with a shovel and bucket, those are just a few of them. Those are the general secondary containment requirements and those are applicable to transfers of fuel as well as portable containers. Okay. Um, another question is, um, if a facility has more than 10,000 gallons above ground storage, but there's no risk to navigable waters, are they required to have a plan in place? There's no requirement to have a plan if you don't satisfy the three threshold requirements. And we, I had mentioned a couple of times in the presentation that it's a good idea to document for yourself how it is that you're not subject to the rule, where one would just that was lay that exactly. out on paper and present some logic to refer to back if it's ever questioned. Um, okay. Next question we have here: um, Have there been any have there been any fines issued to farms in Region Seven in the past five years regarding not have an SPCC plan? Um, if so, could you explain? My ten years shorter than five years, so I can't speak to what's happened in the last five years, only the last year and a half. Um, the only way a facility or a farm would get an inspection from me talking in the present day right now is if there's a spill in navigable water that's reported to the NRC and the EPA has to react to that. Um, Another consideration, too, would just be someone's neighbor who calls up and says, this gentleman down the street, this facility is not compliant with the regulation. That's a formal complaint that's filed with our office that we need to react and follow up to. Okay, everyone, this is uh, this is Jordan Dukes, um, the Director of National Affairs for the Nebraska Farm Bureau, and there was a question out there regarding the um, uh, the CR which was just passed and the delay uh, of enforcement of, of SPCC and and mark that that was in there that um, that EPA essentially was delayed from enforcing EPA or, or was was delayed from enforcing SPCC requirements on farms and ranches um, 
until the end of the fiscal year. That was that just passed uh, last week, so I figured I'd throw that one out there for you. Okay, we do have uh, just a couple of more questions here. Um, this one is, has the EPA estimated an average cost per operation to comply with the rule? There is some of that cost analysis that's calculated when they, that was done when they created the rule back in 1973. But it has it been updated since then? No, and I don't think there's, unless the rule significantly changed, Okay. Um, there's not a mechanism for us to go back through that calculation exercise again. Okay. Um, another question here, can you further discuss how to determine reasonable expectation of a discharge? Uh, don't consider any man-made structures, don't consider secondary containment, consider the topography of the facility as well as the physical and chemical properties of the substance and the environment. The, the environment of which it would flow, travel across the land or travel across the land to water, travel across the land to a drainage ditch to get to a, a nexus of water, um, as well as imagine the worst case discharge where you lose all of your fuel and oil at one time and there's the largest rainstorm one could ever imagine. Where would that water go? And consequently, fuel and oil are going to travel on top of that water at a rate faster than what the water flows. That's the best, best way I can help anyone sort of get to an answer on that. Okay. Um. Another question here is, can you discuss how to evaluate road ditches under the rule? Um, how far down the road do I have to go look or evaluate before I can state that my road ditch is not going to discharge to waters? Um, a road ditch and outfall is always going to go somewhere, and there needs to be some kind of evaluation on where that goes. And I, the, the end of the road is always a different distance depending on which road you're on. Um, the, wa the water goes somewhere. The surface water is running at least three months. Surface water is running at least three months of the year. Uh, look at a nexus of where the water goes with the outfall of that drainage ditch. Um, if it's just a, if it's like in a local suburban area, sometimes those are to a retention or a detention pond where that water is evaporated off and there's no outfall from that detention pond. Um, you may see some pieces of topography like that in rural areas as well or not. But there just needs to be a determination of where that water is. And if a facility determines they're not subject, it's always a good idea to just document that as a piece of history for the facility. Okay. Um, another question here is, um, if you have a 2,000-gallon tank at a center pivot, uh, but the water cannot run off the property, does it still uh, need to have the, the plan in place?
man-made structures that are there to prevent a release from entering surface waters can't, cannot be considered, as well as a lot of places have drain tiles that are put in place, um, which can provide a way for surface waters to enter groundwater and become surface water again. And I know that only serves to confuse this definition just a little bit more. Um, and it all goes back to the owner operator makes that determination. Okay. We've got Steve Nelson just coming into my office and he'd like to ask a question, so I'm going to turn the mic over to him. So hold on just a second. Mark, I'm, I'm not trying to be contrary here, but I guess what it boils down to maybe is can you talk about a situation where a containment facility, facility would not be required? Because basically in all of these questions, it's, you know, there, we've had a lot of different scenarios, and as I've understood the answer that, that in every one of those scenarios there, there is some, some way that you would argue that it, that the spill could get to navigable water. So can you think of an example uh, that you could give us where, where a facility would not be required? I can't hear anything. I would say if there's no reasonable expectation of a discharge to surface water, then the facility is not subject to the rule. With, and with regard to secondary containment requirements but it is part of the SPCC rule. I understand. But it's, it's also part of stormwater pollution prevention and it's also part of fire protection code. But you've basically only, said that if and, if, only, and I'm only speaking with respect to what applies to the SPCC rule. I understand. The space rule, there are, there's no prescriptive there's no prescriptive requirements in the rule that say this is how you need to build your secondary containment. This is how large it needs to be, and this is what it needs to be made out of. It's a level of performance that a facility needs to achieve when they make the determination that they're subject to the rule based on the three threshold requirements. Do you store oil in a capacity greater than 1,320 gallons, and there's a reasonable expectation of a discharge to surface water? So did I understand you correctly earlier when you said that, that any – imaginable rainfall event that could cause such a runoff would would re make that third criteria come into play I said that it's that third criteria could be based on a worst case discharge and also on the largest rain event that could be considered to happen and that rain event is built into the containment calculation for bulk storage containers where that containment needs to be large enough to hold the capacity of the largest container plus sufficient free water for Pacific. And who determines that, that rainfall event? Is that something that an engineer would do? Is that part of the, the engineering plan or does that have to be something that goes beyond that? Are you still there, Mark? Yeah, Mark must have gone off the line here. Okay. Yeah, Mark, Mark came off the line. We'll see if he comes back on. Uh, we have just a couple of more questions that we haven't had, haven't been able to get to yet. Let's see if Mark gets back, gets his connection back on.
I'm not not seeing any not seeing any anything from Mark. He's uh Yeah, we're going to we're going to try to call him and see if he's having technical difficulties on his, his end. Uh we do have one question here that I can answer. Um oh, does say Mark is reconnecting. There we go. Yeah, uh, okay, Alan says please turn on my microphone. Okay, let me get Alan on. There we go. Alan, you should be f live now. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Um, I can just give Mark my headset here, so just stand by for just a moment. Okay. Um, the one question that I do have here is, can we get a copy of the presentation? Um, what I can tell you on that, and, and Mark and... Alan, you can um, let us know if the, if the presentation is available for us to to share. But the recording is definitely, we have recorded this. We will post it on our YouTube site. It will also be on the GoToMeeting site. So you will be getting an email. Everyone that registered for the webinar today will get an email tomorrow with a link on how you can watch this uh, webinar again. Um, as far as Mark... And Alan, if you guys can let us know if we can uh, share the presentation out. So beyond that, sure, I, can, I can send a link to the presentation. It's also available on the SPCC for Agriculture page. Okay. So, so I can really specifically tell you how to find out. Uh, I'll include um, information about the template and the sample plans as well as uh, contact information there. Okay. And I'm sorry I dropped off. I know. Steve and I were having a discourse there, and I don't know at what point everyone lost me. Yeah. I apologize for that. So. I know Steve is not in my office anymore. Um, he is in the other room. We can turn him back on if he has any other questions. We can plug his. He's got a microphone in the other room as well. So. Okay. I don't know if you have any more questions from the field either. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm back on. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Well, I, I don't. Uh, you know, I think we covered it fairly well there, and I, I think we can pursue uh, some of those specific questions more. I, I guess we, maybe we're getting to the point where it's time to, to wrap this up. But certainly, if there's any other questions, why we would want to make sure. That we Okay. Yeah, we do have just a couple more questions. We'll go through here if we if uh, if we have some time. Uh, one of these is the definition of discharge in the SPCC rules specifically exempts discharges allowed under Section 402 of the Clean Water Act, which is the NPDES permit section that feedlots are governed by. Can you explain this exemption and how it relates to the fuel stored on that facility? My limited understanding of NIPTES discharge permits is that the facility is allowed to discharge certain substances in certain quantities and is not allowed to discharge things that are not the permit. That's just my limited understanding from it. It's not my area of expertise. Um, so I would, I guess, ask the question, is oil included or is not included in that NIPTES permit, which would allow a discharge of that from the facility? And then if you look at a regulation, a provision that's only applicable to the SPCC rule, there's water that's collected inside containment, and there's one requirement that is in place where before the owner operator actuates that valve to drain the water from outside containment, you need to physically look at it and ensure that there's no oil or sheet present. 
Once that determination has been made, the water can be discharged from the container. If that water discharge from the containment flows directly to a water course, i.e. a surface water in the U.S., there's still that requirement to visually determine whether there's oil or a sheen present before you open the valve and discharge it. And there's an additional requirement to keep a record of that discharge to the containment, or to, I'm sorry, to the surface water. Okay, um, and I have one question left here, so I will go ahead and ask that, um, and that is, will EPA be issuing further guidance on navigable waters? I don't have an answer to that at this time. We're still operating under guidance that was developed after the Rapanos case. Okay, well that looks like all the questions that I do have. I do have one hand raised. Um, David Nickel, I, I know we asked a question that he had typed in, but I'm going to go ahead and turn his microphone on if he does have an additional question. And David, you are on. But I don't see that he's... Okay, I think that's going to do it for the questions. David doesn't seem to be responding there. So, um, Mark, I want to thank you for uh, um, leading us through this today and uh, answering all the questions. Um, do you have anything you would like to close with, or I will let Steve do a closing as well, too. So, I'd like to thank you for working with Jordan to set the webinar up today. Thank you to Jordan and you and Steve for getting all this information out to your producers and giving us an opportunity to get some hand, information in the hands of the producers in Nebraska. Thank you. Well, thank, well, thank you. you, Mark. Uh, certainly do appreciate uh, the time that you've spent here uh, this morning in providing this information. I. I hope it's at least it's been educational from the perspective of helping us know what what we need to do and know some of the questions we need to ask and so uh, certainly certainly appreciate that and and uh, we do have your your uh, contact information here and and so I think that that'll uh, there'll be some opportunities there if people have questions and want want to get those answered or want to continue to have the conversation so again certainly thank you very much on behalf of uh, Nebraska Farm Bureau the Nebraska Cattlemen Nebraska Corn Growers Association and the Nebraska Soybean Association for for uh, your willingness to provide this information for us and uh, and again we thank you uh, Mark very much and and uh, your staff there uh, as well as uh, thank you to everyone that's on and uh, certainly if you have any questions why there's been a lot of information provided today and and uh, you can certainly give uh, give us here a call at Nebraska Farm Bureau as well for for any other information. So uh, thank you to everyone and um, have the sun out here in Lincoln. I hope that that's the case uh, in much of Nebraska and uh, so uh, look forward to having a, a great day. Thank you. Yeah, well thank you everyone and again we will have a copy of the webinar or recording uh, will be placed on our YouTube channel. We will send out uh, information on that to everyone and we'll also get some copies of the presentation and have links available so that uh, those of you today and others will be able to uh, take a look at this as well. So thanks everybody for participating in this webinar today. Uh, have a good day. <laughs>